Well, welcome everybody to the 18th annual Missouri American Water MR340 race. And we are really excited to be joining all of you for a week on the Missouri River for this amazing race. Um, this race is amazing because of you and everything that you bring to it. On this video, we're gonna run through some of the things that will keep you safe during this race, things that you absolutely need to know and consider to be able to finish this race and complete it safely. So when you sign your safety waiver, you'll be checking a box confirming that you watched this whole video. So also please share it with your ground crews. It's good information for everybody to have on the race course. Uh, my name is Scott Mansker. I'm, uh, I've been with the race since the beginning back in 2006. I'm super excited to be a part of it this year. And a uh, big part of my job is safety boats. I'm in a safety boat and I help coordinate the positions and staffing of the safety boats. So looking forward to the uh, 18th annual. Hi, my name is Christina Ruiz. I'm the race director for the MR340. So if you're emailing the race or if you have any questions, I'll be the one responding to you. I will see you all at race check-in at Cop Point on July 31st and at race start at Cop Point on August 1st. And I will especially be looking forward to welcoming many of you to your finish line in St. Charles. And I'm Steve Schnarr and I'm the race dispatch this year. If you or your ground crew calls the number on the safety card um, that you will receive at race check-in, it's likely to be me that'll answer and respond to your needs. And we might have some other folks helping too. Um, and this is Steve Schnarr again. I am the director of Missouri River Relief. We're the organization that's hosting the MR340. And we love participating in this race. It is one of the highlights of our year. Our mission is all about connecting people to the Missouri River. Everything we do has that goal in mind and the 340 race is right in line with our mission. Cannot wait to meet all you out there. The work that we do on the Missouri River involves thousands of volunteers. In our 22 years working on the Big Muddy, we've worked with 32,000 volunteers to remove over 2 million pounds of trash from the Missouri River. Our educational programs have touched more than 36,000 students and teachers. The Missouri River is our love and we cannot wait to share it with all of you for a week. The title sponsor for Missouri American Water MR340 is Missouri American Water. They're one of the major drinking water providers in the state of Missouri. And they want us to know that over half of all Missourians get their drinking water from the Missouri River. They see the importance of all this work to bring people to the river, to get to know it more deeply and understand the importance of this really amazing freshwater resource we have right here. Missouri American Water is also a crucial behind the scenes partner in making this race possible. While we're all working our way down the river, Missouri American Water crews will be working hard at the finish line preparing everything for you. They love the race as much as all of us and we are so grateful for their work making it happen. And here's a little more from Missouri American Water. Hi, I'm Rich Finland, president of Missouri American Water. On behalf of nearly 700 employees that keep life flowing for one in four Missourians, I welcome you to the annual Missouri American Water MR340 race. Kudos to you on participating in the world's longest non-stop paddle race. You should be proud of the dedication that got you here. We're honored to once again be the title sponsor of this incredible competition. Race proceeds help benefit environmental stewardship by raising awareness of the importance of our local rivers, particularly the Missouri River, which serves as a source of drinking water for millions of Missourians. Remember to stay safe and hydrated, have fun, and look out for one another. We look forward to seeing you at the finish line. This race could not happen without the support of a long list of sponsors and partners. 
A few shout outs to our sponsors. Still 630 is a local distillery based in downtown St. Louis. You'll see them at the finish line party. At the finish line party, they're going to be selling some exclusive bottles of whiskey specially blended for the race that you'll be able to purchase if you can be one of the first hundred people in line. And all the proceeds from those bottles go to the race and to Missouri River Relief. Also, the Alpine Shop is a treasured outdoor gear and paddling gear company based in Kirkwood um, with stores across the state and now even in Kansas. And this year, Alpine Shop is celebrating their 50th year serving our communities. Happy birthday, Alpine Shop. The Nature Conservancy of Missouri is a treasured partner and you'll see them at the Klondike Checkpoint volunteering and giving out free drinks and snacks. Be sure to tell them thank you when you see them. Now the finish line party will be on Friday night, starting about 5.30. This is hosted by some more of our awesome sponsors. We got Big Muddy Adventures, Terrain Magazine, and Schlafly Brewing. And Schlafly is the official finish line beer. In fact, uh, the Schlafly Bankside restaurant is just a few steps from the finish line. So of course, we are always deeply grateful for our finish line host, the Lewis and Clark Boathouse and Museum. Be sure to go in and check out those folks. And we've got some more sponsors that help make this happen. Super grateful to all these companies and organizations that make this race happen. Thank you, guys. Another really important piece of this puzzle is all of you. As part of your registration, all of you have donated money to Missouri River Relief, and some of you have taken it a step further. So this is a list of some of our top fundraisers from all of you. Thank you so much for that extra effort to bring your family and friends into this effort to support Missouri River Relief. You folks are the best. Thank you. Now, here are some of the astonishing records that have been set during the MR340. Uh, we got two pages of slides here of folks that have hit these top marks. Um, and we've got that, all this stuff is on our website too. So, um, you know, these are the times to beat. Here's a second page including a couple records that were set last year, which is pretty exciting. Um, and last year was another you know, low water year, which is kind of what we expect this year. You never know what the river's gonna get us. Um, but even in a low water year, people can really make it happen, so. All right, now, race check-in. So this is Monday, July 31st, the day before the race. And it is required that you come on Monday to race check-in at Caw Point Park. We're gonna be there from noon to about 8 p.m. So go ahead and bring your printed and signed waiver. If you don't have it, we'll have copies too, no worries. So you're gonna pick up your t-shirt and your safety card. Um, and you're also gonna check through all the registration data that we have to make sure everything's up to date. We know things change right up to the last minute. So we wanna make sure we get everything right before the race starts. Then every one of you are gonna perform your first race owl checkpoint check-in. We'll have tech help there to walk through if it's your first time and it's a little different this year. So we'll get to that in a bit but we need to make sure that everybody knows this process, how it works, works with your phone. The whole process should take about a half an hour to move through race check-in. Um, and there's also gonna be some booths from some of our sponsors and you can definitely pick up some awesome MR340, MR340 merch. Um, you might even be able to pick up some last minute gear that you need for the race from one of our sponsors. Um, but overall, it's just a really cool scene see all the boats, all these people from all over the country arriving to Caw Point Park and getting ready for the MR340. In addition, a lot of people decide to bring their boat and leave it at Caw Point Park 
overnight so that it's ready to go in the morning for race start. Uh, most people do this. We do recommend that you do not leave any pricey electronics, expensive paddles, or other valuables with your boat. We will have security overnight, but there is absolutely no guarantee. So bring those expensive items with you Tuesday morning for the race start when you're walking in or parking at Caw Point Park. Okay, this is the big map showing you all of the parking options for race day, August 1st. Caw Point parking fills quickly. If you're not already there, somewhere around 6 a.m., you'll likely get directed out of the park and back on the Fairfax Tropicway. So avoid all that and just plan to park outside Caw Point Park if possible. So all of these areas marked in green are places that we highly suggest you park and in the process consider using the Riverfront Heritage Trail to then access Caw Point on foot, which is marked in purple. Uh, yeah, if your ground crew plans to use one of those folding wagons when meeting you throughout the race, consider having them use it with you on race morning too, in order to just walk yourself and all your gear in from the trail. And again, this year, the kind folks of KCK are allowing you all to use the municipal lot number four, which is the big space in green here um, with the number three on it, located between State Avenue and Minnesota. So that's hundreds of free parking spaces offered by the city between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. on race day. That's a huge amount of parking. We suggest you park there if you can. Use that Heritage Trail to walk in. Um, that's plenty of time to arrive, walk in, have your ground crew take care of you, and have your ground crew get back after your race start to their vehicle. So lots of buffer time there. Hilton Garden Inn is an option for those of you who are staying there by chance the night before anyway. So just go ahead and um, continue to stay parked in their hotel parking garage if that works for you. Parking is also available across the street, um, the south side of the hotel in the free city parking lot. And then there's another little parking lot right there next to it that has metered parking if you wanna park there. And there's various street parking on Armstrong and North Fifth, wherever you might be able to find it. And then there's a tiny area under the overpass off of Armstrong northbound, and it's connected right to the Riverfront Heritage Trail. So not many spots, but that would be a great spot. All right. And then this is the Cop Point Park zoomed in view from that previous map. So if you're actually choosing to park at Cop Point race morning, please look out for and listen to our volunteer parking attendants for instructions that they give you as you enter the area. Racers can be dropped off by crew at Caw Point and then have crew go park elsewhere and come back. That's an option. We encourage all spectators, your family, friends, people who are just coming to watch the start to park outside in one of those other areas and then come in through, through the Heritage Trail. Um, all walk-in traffic should be coming from the Heritage Trail and please do not walk into the entrance where the cars are coming in because that area will be really dark. There's not a lot of good visibility early in the morning and it's just a congested spot. Uh, big trucks and SUVs, if you choose to try parking at Cobb Point, you should try to move into the Southwest parking area. There are also going to be some spots under the overpass where cars can fill in. So there are some concrete barricades that should be open by that morning to fit some of you into that area. Uh, do not park in the Caw Point Industrial Parking Lot. So that's the area just before you're coming into the park. Um, and don't park anywhere before the actual entrance of parking for Caw Point. So, um, note the one-way entrance to the west end of the flood wall and then the one-way exit out. And do share this map with your ground crew, anyone who might be coming to, to watch you for race start, your family and friends who want to see you off at Caw Point, get a plan together as to where you're going to park and plan to come early. 
The, this map is available in an email dispatch that's already been sent out, but it's also on our MR340.org website under the resources tab and the race course page if you need to send it to family and friends. Um, yeah, many racers have preferred to park in the options outside a cop point compared to fighting the bumper bumper to traffic. So keep in mind, a lot of Kansas City people are heading to work on a Tuesday morning. Just park where it's easy and relaxed outside of the park if you can, and try not to, you know, deal with the stress of parking. Okay, launching, as with parking, can be a little crowded at the ramp at Caw Point because there are literally hundreds of, of you all in boats that need to get into the water there. So we ask that you get yourself adjusted, all your pedals, your dry spaces, your gear, your selfies, get all of those things in place and out of the way before you head down to the ramp. And we'll want two lines going down to the ramp, just like in this picture. You'll need to be ready to go when you get to the water and then you'll wanna get on the water quickly, efficiently, but carefully. And here's a view of launching continuing while others are already on the water. This process takes a little while. And so our tip to you is to scout out the bank during Monday check-in while you're there anyway. And you can get a feel for what the bank looks like and even consider putting in at a spot somewhere just off the ramp, upstream or downstream of the ramp. And I think our next map shows an overhead view of that. Um, this area with the circle in orange is the point there at Cobb Point, and there's some space there available for you to launch. You don't have to put in right on the ramp if you don't want to, and in fact, I'll be suggesting lighter weight boats as you're coming down the ramp to go ahead and cut out of the line and launch off of one side or the other of the ramp. Um, totally not required, but up to you if you want to do that. And this imaginary line in yellow is the start line noted. So that line is across from the downstream ramp edge. So this is the official start line of the MR340. And you'll want to get settled in above stream from that. And on the water, you'll want to be behind that line for your race start. Start time will be 7 a.m. for solos and 8 a.m. for all other divisions. And thinking about parking again ahead of time, even if you're in that 8 a.m. group, you're still going to want to be at Caw Point really early if you're considering, especially if you're considering parking at Caw Point or just to be ready in general. So make note of your race start time, depending on which division you are, and still plan to be at cop point extra early. Avoid the confluence cluster. So you'll be launching into the Kansas River from cop point park, and you're gonna have a lot of time ahead of you when you start the race. So there's no need to have a sprint start from the start line once the race starts. You can if you want, um, but as you approach the Missouri River, the Missouri water will turn you downstream to the right. And this is the point at which racer, racers can get pushed close together. So give yourself and everyone extra space to avoid any possible collisions there. Um, if it's your first MR340, feel free to hold back a bit and just watch how things sort out ahead of you and plan your course as you see an opening. If you do dump your boat here, help each other out, wait for a safety boat. There is a lot of dynamic water going on here. A lot of you all in boats and things moving about um, where these two rivers meet at the confluence. KCK and KCMO, Swift Water Rescue will be in the water nearby. We'll also have safety boats in the water. So just hang tight with your boat if you do find yourself outside of your boat and help each other 
and try not to panic and we'll get you taken care of. Okay, let's talk about the possibility of a, the remote possibility of a weather delay. Uh, in the prior 17 years of the 340, we've only had one. So knock on uh, wood, we don't have to deal with this, but we just want you to know that it is possible if there's weather in the morning, uh, you'll probably get a text message from us giving you our best information if the start's going to be delayed or not. If it is delayed, we try to manage it in half hour increments um, plan A would be, you know, that we would just push the 7 a.m. start into the 8 a.m. start. So all 500 boats would start together at 8 a.m. as we wait for weather to improve in the morning. If it has to get pushed past that, we would do it, you know, there'd be an 8.30 option, a 9 option, et cetera. Mostly what we're looking for here is just to get the lightning out of the area. We would definitely start in rain. Um, that's not going to be an issue. It would just be lightning that would be an issue for us. So if there are significant delays, then we would adjust the downstream checkpoint cutoff times, uh, especially Waverly, uh, accordingly. The first thing after we do finally start is you're going to have several bridges to deal with um, back to back to back right out of the gate. So it's great that it's in daylight and you get to kind of understand if you've never been on the Missouri River or a big river before, how bridges and their giant uh, piers kind of interact with the current. So you'll see that all uh, in daylight, which is fantastic. And you'll also have a lot of company as you see here. So it's important that we share the channel and make sure you're not bumping into each other and pushing each other into anything dangerous. Uh, sometimes there, you can see in this picture, one of these piers has a bunch of logs stuck to it. Uh, that is not uncommon on this river. Big trees get pinned to these piers and then they catch other trees. And it, so it just, it just makes for more squirrely water around that. And certainly something that you would not want to get your boat near. Cause if you, you essentially just become one more log on that pile and it can be a dangerous situation. So give each other a bunch of room and kind of plan your path through those uh, well before you get there. You just kind of uh, follow the person in front of you and all should be well. We do have some construction. There's, there seems to be always at least one bridge under construction on the race course every year. This year we've got a couple and <laughs> happens to be the very first one that you'll uh, encounter as you leave Caw Point. Uh, this is the Buck O'Neill Bridge. They've been working on it for a couple years now. They've got a ways to go. You can see that there are construction barges in the water uh, under the bridge. And those, we can't even guess where those are going to be in, in uh, on July or on August 1st. So there's no way to predict that. But just know that you're probably going to see that. The Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas Fire Departments will have boats in the water. Their swift water rescue teams are out there. Thank you, guys. And uh, they will make sure you're not headed towards any danger. But in general, from Caw Point Park to the finish line, you're going to see uh, barges moored on the water. And you're going to have to know that you do not want to get you know, yourself pinned to one of those. So here's a chance to, to practice that. Uh, if there's anything alarming that we see there in the construction setup the night before the race, we'll let you know. But just be ready to follow the, the channel, the clear path, and uh, not get yourself in any dead ends there around those tow boats and barges. This is the second one, and you'll see it a couple hundred miles downstream. This is the I-70 bridge near Roachport, Missouri. Now you're looking, uh, you're looking downstream. So you would be traveling the direction of that arrow, not the direction that the boat taking the picture is traveling. This is a picture from a while back, so it's gonna look different. They've actually added a lot of structure and the second bridge is being built now. Uh, but you see the construction cranes on barges. Those could be anywhere. Uh, some of the, you know, significant number of you will go through this in the dark. So you just need to know um, 
that you want to choose the, the channel span most likely. You want to avoid, as you see here, the bridge piers that are marked with the red arrows. And you want to make sure that you have a clear path with no construction barge or construction crane in your way. The great thing is that at night, the bridges have a system of kind of telling, telling you where to go. Generally speaking, there will be red lights or red reflectors on the piers up high. And that is telling you, don't go this way. And then there will be a green light, or in some cases, a reflector on the channel span where a towboat or a canoe can safely go. And so it really simplifies it in low visibility conditions in the dark where uh, you can just kind of line yourself up with the green and know you're most likely going to be fine. Um, what you'd want to avoid though is in fog or something like that, those lights are not going to be easy to see. And so you would not want to try to be on the river moving, especially under anything like a bridge in the fog. Yeah, and I'm going to go back a, a slide too, just to follow up on that. Um, you know, one more thing, if you're traveling in the fog or even worse at night in the fog, um, which again, we do not recommend, you know, when when there's um, objects like this, construction barges or other barges that, you know, not only at these construction sites, but other locations along the river that might be tied up along the side of the river, you know, those are not going to show up on your, you know, GPS navigation app. Um, and so if you're in the fog uh, trying to proceed down river, you're not going to see those things that might be tied up on the side. So just one more warning about that. And we'll probably warn you again about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say most incidents that occur on the Mississippi and Missouri River that involve damage to property or harm to people's uh, health are with parked obstacles, less so than moving obstacles on the river, uh, at least as far as barges go. Uh, you're much more likely to suffer an injury from something that's parked or stationary than you are from, from something that's moving. And speaking of that, um, another object that we'll, we'll encounter on the river are sand dredges. So, the first sand dredge that you're going to see is probably going to be in the first 10 or 15 miles of the race. Um, there's generally a, a dredge working just downstream of Kansas City. Um, and again, we won't really know that situation until really the week of the race. Um, so sand dredges are anchored in place and um, they're essentially sucking sand off the bottom of the river and then loading it into barges. And those boat barges are taken by towboat to a sand plant nearby. So a couple things about dredges. One is that um, this picture doesn't show it really well, but you know, here's some cables coming off of the dredge. Some dredges will have cables coming off the side, actually, quite a ways out from the dredge. Um, those are anchored to, you know, generally concrete blocks on the bottom of the river. Um, but they can be really hard to see. So anytime you do encounter a dredge on the river, just give it plenty of space. You know, please don't just sort of scoot right around the side of it. Give it plenty of space. Um, there can be other boats, um, assist boats tied up to those dredges. Um, there could be tow boats with barges coming to and fro from those, from the dredges as well. And that's something you'll definitely see. So, you know, if you see a dredge on the river, you know, keep in mind there's probably nearby somewhere a towboat that uh, might be bringing an empty barge or a full sand barge to the sand plant nearby. Those plants are, um, you know, usually within 10 or at the most 15 miles from the dredge, but that's just sort of more local traffic that will be going on. Um, I guess one one other thing about about these dredges at night they are supposed to have some sort of light um, lighting up the dredge so you can see them but it can be pretty difficult to see they can be pretty uh, low intensity lights that they're marking these 
dredges with which is which is helpful you know it doesn't destroy your night vision but um they can kind of sneak up on you so um you know just just keep in mind that that's part of the scene out there now knowing where the channel is in in the river is important for several reasons um First of all, that's where the speediest water is going to be. So it's going to get you towards St. Charles the fastest. Second of all, the channel is where barges are also going to be. So knowing where the channel is means you can get out of the channel to avoid barges. Um, and we'll hear a little bit more about barges in a second. Um, but third is by staying in the channel, you can avoid wing dikes and the swirly water that's uh, associated with them. Now, the Missouri River used to be about three times wider than it is now. Um, starting back in the 1930s, the Corps of Engineers started to shrink the channel of the river through a process called channelization. So they were basically squeezing the river to make it more narrow, deeper, and to sort of lock it in place. That means that the Missouri River is highly engineered. So once you get used to the patterns of how it flows and where the channel goes, it can be pretty predictable like where you can find the channel once you're looking at the shape of the river. So this map is showing you just a little chunk from the Army Corps of Engineers navigation charts. You can see that the channel tends to stay on the outside of bends as you're moving downstream. Um, and these little symbols, these stand for the navigation markers that you will see posted on the side of the river. Um, they're going to be posted on the bank of the river. They're often nailed to trees. We'll, we'll get to those in a second. Now, each sign will have one symbol on one side and another symbol on the back side. So the solid means that like this green one here, if you're approaching that sign the solid, and you're seeing a solid sign, that means the channel is staying on that side of the river up until that sign. And then when you look at the back side of that sign, there will usually be a cross hatched. Um, so in, in this case, it's, it's green um, if it's gonna be on your right side. And that cross hatch is telling you that your next move is going to, the channel is going to be crossing to the other side. Um, so as you're paddling by in your canoe or kayak, you can look back over your shoulder after you pass a sign and you'll see the backside and that's going to tell you your next move. So, um, yeah. So this channel crossing you know, once you see that crossing marker over your back shoulder, you know, it's it's a gentle sloping cross to the other side. It's going to cross towards the sign on the opposite bank, which may be hard to see. Um, it may be, you know, uh, it may be a long way as if it's a real long bend, but it's not like, you know, the channel doesn't sort of, you know, take a right degree turn and, and cross the river. It's going to be a gentle sloping uh, curve. You know, one thing that we like to say is if you think about the river as a five lane highway, in general, you're going to be, want to be in lanes two, three, and four. You don't really necessarily need to be all the way over on the bank um, unless you're really avoiding, you know, some an obstacle or a watercraft or something like that. In general, staying towards the middle, you're pretty good. That's the general good flow in the river. The channel and how it behaves is different if the river's high or if it's low and slow. So these things kind of change depending on whether the wing dikes are visible or they're underwater. But staying in the channel can help you avoid underwater obstacles like dikes um, and help you get out of the channel if there's a barge approaching. So it's just important to know where that is for that safer and fastest water to find that safe spot on the river. Anything else about that that I missed, you guys? No. Look, sounds good to me. We'll talk more about it as we go, I'm sure. For sure. Um, so this is what a channel marker, uh, also known as a day marker, looks like on the Mississippi River. So over there on the big Mississippi River, each sign has its own post. They usually have lights. 
They look really nice. They're sturdy and strong. But you get over to the Missouri River, and this might be what you're more likely to see on the Missouri. Things are not always taken care of. They're not as high tech as the Missouri River, Mississippi River. So not every day marker is necessarily gonna be where it's supposed to be. Some will be overgrown with vines. So you can't necessarily count on them. Um, and that's where using navigational aids like the Pro Paddler app can really help you find that channel in some of those tricky spots where it's difficult to see what's going on. Um, and you know, real quickly, in the beginning of the race, the race becomes kind of a, like a conga line of, of boats. So, you know, looking ahead, you can see where other people are going and really start, you know, if you're kind of new to the Missouri River, you start to see, okay, I see what's going on here. I see, I see where I can start crossing and, and I can see, you know, where, where to, to sort of follow things. Now, um, I do also recommend, you know, I mentioned before, there's really no reason to get right over to the bank uh, real close to the bank when you're when you're paddling on that channel side it's really good to leave like a 50 to really even a hundred foot between you and the bank um, that can avoid some slower water that's associated with the bank uh, but just giving yourself a little extra space all right buoys are the physical in water channel markers, similar to um, the channel markers that Steve was just talking about. So they're very big, they're metal, and they're pretty substantial. Um, the green ones are called cans, and they're going to mark your starboard right descending channel. So as you're going downstream, which you, you should be, um, <laughs> you should see them on your right-hand side. And then the red nuns, as they're called, those red buoys mark the port left descending channel edge. So they're um, attached by chains to concrete sinkers. They technically should stay put, but they're not always gonna stay put due, due to being dislodged at times or something. So in general, they indicate the right hand and left hand edges of that channel. And you'll see them throughout your entire race. And they're giving just a dotted line idea of where the edges of the channel should be. Um, and so um, similar to what Steve was just talk talking about with the channel markers, by understanding where these buoys are and recognizing that path, you're going to know where the barges have to travel within these spaces. And by understanding that, you'll know where the channel is not and where you can make a good decision in case you need to get out of that channel to avoid a barge or recreational boats, whatever it might be. So don't get close to these, don't tie up to them. They can swing wildly sometimes or even be partially submerged and just kind of pop out. So look for little disturbances at the channel's edge. That might be a buoy that you're seeing affecting the water. Um, and uh, they do have reflective tape on them. So you can shine your flashlight on them at night and listen for them at night. You can get a feel during the day of how much water passes around these, what they sound like, and then in the dark at night, you'll hear them um, and be familiar with that sound. And this is a picture of a couple of buoys, which at least one of them is clearly out of place because a barge couldn't actually navigate between these two. So don't take them literally but get the feel for where they are and just the pattern that you experience with these um, buoys along, along the way. And then you'll get the hang of recognizing when they're out of place. And if I could add to, um, because we've had really pretty stable low water for quite a while on the river, on the Missouri River this year, um, a lot, there's a lot of buoys out there. So a lot of times when the river comes up and down, it'll dislodge them and, and move them on downstream. Um, but this year, uh, there's, there's just a lot of them. And it, and it seems like with the lower water too, in order to mark, mark some of the low spots, um, or barges in particular, that there's really like maybe more buoys out this year than, than I've even seen before. So uh, definitely just be aware of that. 
Yep, and give them give them space as you're going by. Hopefully, you're not going to be right up next to them anyway. Yeah, that's right. Wing dikes are the rock structures that are added to the Missouri River to narrow and deeper the river, or deepen the river, and create and maintain that channel, that barge channel. And they come in different shapes and sizes, but they're almost always found on the opposite side of the channel. So normally during your race, you're not going to have any need to be close to one of these. And um, you, you won't have a need to be right up against them at all. So avoid them and know that they extend farther into the water than you're actually probably seeing and can create um, some big eddies near them. The Corps of Engineers has put down a lot of extra rock on these structures this year. So pay close attention to those channel markers at night, listen for these as the, you know, you might hear some rushing water around the ends of these. And then as Steve was talking about, especially at night, just err on the side of traveling down the middle of the river. So those are ways you can avoid wing dikes during the night also. And they don't show up very well with a flashlight. Um, and some of the older, the, the rock that's been there longer is brown and you might even see stuff growing on top of these right now. They're very exposed currently in low water, but, and you'll really recognize the new rock in places. It's very bright and you'll see that from a greater distance. Um, and the good news about wing dikes for you all is that they can be a place of a, a safe haven of sorts. So if you want to duck behind one to avoid barge wake, that's definitely an option. And you can use that area behind them when even you might need to stop and call safety dispatch. So if you need a place to stop and you don't have a ramp nearby or a good bank, maybe you wanna duck behind one of these. And in slow or still water behind them, you can use them to your advantage like that if you need to. And I just wanted to point out too, cause it in this picture shows it, you know, the wing dikes are the, that's the name for the dikes that jut out into the river, um, often somewhat perpendicular to the current. Um, another type of dike you'll see a lot of are trailing dikes um, or revetment dikes that are parallel to the current of the river. So like this large one that you can see kind of in the back of this photo. Um, and so the channel is often runs adjacent to uh, these long uh, revetment dikes. So um, that's just, just giving you a name to what you're gonna see out there. All right, let's talk a bit about barge traffic and where all these dikes are built for. Uh, there will, you know, every year we probably encounter, I don't know, three or four uh, through boats that are actually um, not just servicing a, a building a dike or servicing a sand dredge, but are actually moving cargo somewhere on the system. Um, so we share the river with them. We have a great partnership with navigation and, you know, they're, they know the rules of the river. And so we just need to make you aware of what their expectation is for kayaks and canoes being out there on the river with them. Um, most of these guys and gals who work the river have experienced the race before they've worked the race before um, been on the river while it's happening so they have some familiarity with the event and will certainly be aware that it's going on uh, i think what they most would want from us is they want you to be aware of where the channel is where they have to go and then they want you to behave predictably I mean, we've all been driving down the road and a squirrel runs in the middle of the road and then she goes left, she goes right, she goes left, she goes right. She can't decide which way to get out of your way. And um, that doesn't end well often. So um, what they want is us to just make the right decision and then demonstrate visually that we have made the right decision. So that means generally like you've made a turn and you're sticking with that turn because it was the right move to make. Uh, you know, you also need to assess with each time you encounter a towboat pushing a load of barges, um, how big is the weight going to be and how am I going to deal with that weight? So there's two issues. 
first issue, how can I get out of the way of this thing and be well out of the way so nobody's nervous? And secondly, what kind of wake are we dealing with? So um, the the tow boat on the bottom is pushing. I can you can tell that those are lightly loaded barges because they are mostly out of the water. So they're not displacing a bunch of water. He's got empties, and so you can hope that that means uh, not a super big wake behind the tow boat because he's not having to use as much horsepower to move that. The one at the top of your screen that looks like some kind of petroleum. Uh, petroleum barges. So there might be asphalt or asphalt oil or something on there. And that's a big boat and it might have a much bigger wake behind it because of its displacement. If they're going downstream, it's generally less wake. If they're going upstream, it's generally more wake. Also in the bottom photo, you can see we've circled this moment. Um, and this was where somebody was, uh, they were actually, they left the ramp. This was at Huntsdale. They left the ramp with the initial intention to go around on the uh, far side of this load. It's like, so to the right of your screen, that's where they started heading. Then at the last second, inexplicably, they decided, oh, we better be on the other side. And so they cut like the squirrel back in front of this towboat. And I thought this was going to end super bad. Thankfully the towboat, he had seen them on his left and then he saw them turn back in front of him and you could immediately hear him throttle back and wait because once they got in front of his load there, he can't see him anymore. If you can't see his windows, he can't see you. And he waited there kind of hovering, hoping, and we were all holding our breath and they popped out on the other side, his right side. Uh, I don't know why they did that. It was a panic thing to do. Uh, there was plenty of real estate on their other side to make it. Um, so those are the kind of things we hope to avoid. You see it coming. If it's coming from below you downstream, you generally have time to make a good decision. And we also are, will be communicating as much as we can via text message when we know the approximate location of towboat traffic, uh, we will be able to say in a text message, there's a towboat upstream of mile 200, for example. Uh, his plan is to pull over at mile 280 tonight. And uh, so you'll have that information, but it's not perfect. And so you need to be alert and aware. That means in that you are if you're using headphones or a speaker on your boat, it is down low enough that you can hear a towboat's engines. You can hear a towboat if he uh, uses his horn to signal. Uh, that's important. At night, you are paying attention to lights and um, any kind of spotlight, searchlight activity that a towboat might be using. And you're certainly paying attention if they do have, if they have pulled over, which they most likely do at night. Uh, that you are aware that that could be parked right alongside the channel side of the river and you need to be looking and aware that something could be right there in your way. Got some more photos of how to uh, interact with the tow boats as well. So as Christina and Steve talk, talked about buoys and wing dikes, here's a good visual of what that looks like. Uh, if and you can also see there's a ton of room. I mean, there's, there's room for these, these guys pass each other on the river going upstream and downstream. So they can certainly handle passing some canoes and stand up paddle boards. You can see how much room there is. Uh, if you've got a discerning eye, you can see where the channel is, right? You can see the outside bend. That is where the tow boat is going. You can see that um, a canoe or kayak, having realized that there's a tow boat coming, could easily move outside the channel to the wing dike side. And this tow boat's going downstream, so you'd be going downstream as well. So you can see the water trailing off these dikes. Uh, you can travel right along that edge of those dikes and still make good time if you'd like, knowing that, wow, if, if I don't like his waves or I feel uncomfortable, I can just plop right in here 
have a safe place. There's a beach, there's shade. Sometimes I can uh, wait for these waves to go by. And that's what a lot of people choose to do, especially at night. If a towboat was passing you at night and you felt like you couldn't really tell the size and dimensions of that boat, you could certainly just pull off in the wing dikes and be fine. So uh, one other thing that I'm going to mention is this year, um, because of the Infrastructure Act that was passed uh, a couple of years ago, there is an absolute ton of rock work going on on the river right now. So um, what that means is that we have generally a towboat with one or two barges um, that are going to a quarry or a loading site alongside the river. They're loading up with rock. They usually have um, like a track hoe or a backhoe or some really huge equipment to move that rock. And then they're going to be going to wing dikes or revetments or trail dikes alongside the river um, and placing that rock. So they're right now, um, I believe there's 10 and, and possibly even more different tow boats that are doing rock work along the Missouri River. Um, we'll be talking to all of those companies as the race approaches. They'll all be aware of the race exactly when it's happening. Um, how it's going to proceed during the week. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're going to be trying to get their work done during the day while the race is going on. So, you know, it's, it's highly possible that we, that you will encounter more tow boats or barges, you know, this year than ever before. And although most of those are not going to be moving freight through the whole race course, they're going to be, you know, moving 10, 15, 20 miles back and forth from work sites to loading areas. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about fog and, and how that relates to towboat traffic. This is a great photo just because in this photo, you can see that the pilot house is above the low lying fog and anything in that fog cloud down low would be completely invisible to the pilot of that boat. And he may still be driving that boat because he has radar that would pick up anything metallic in the water. Uh, he can see the tree line. He has a chart plotter that shows him the river in his spot in the river. And so he's not thinking about kayaks or canoes being in his way. Everything on his screen says, go, go, go. So again, we're just trying to reiterate to you, uh, you should not be moving your boat in fog. That is a very bad decision because of no, no matter what electronics you're carrying along with you, unless you somehow have radar on your uh, stand up paddleboard, um, there's, there's really, you're blind. You're not, uh, you're not proceeding in a safe manner. Here's another example. This is Jameson Island there. Beautiful place to pull over and stop if you're tired during the race. Probably what, about mile 217 or something like that, 215. But uh, this is a towboat with his barge load going downstream. And you can see how narrow it can be uh, for you in, in a stretch like this where there's a sandbar, huge sandbar accreted. Uh, there's not a ton of room in this situation. And so you would definitely want to, you know, get out of the way and you, would, you definitely want to be aware that his visibility or her visibility may not be enough to see you in the water with that fog if you're traveling through that fog. Um, but you can also see how there's habitat for you to find egress out of the way, out of the channel. You can kind of see in the water there, there, that sandbar continues underwater. You can see the ripples. You can see a buoy uh, there in the water marking that. So, you know, a lot of people hate buoys. I generally am not thrilled, but you know, the good thing about a buoy line is if you see a towboat and you see a buoy line, you immediately know where that towboat's going to be and you immediately know where it's not going to be. And you can be inside the buoy line or outside the buoy line. It doesn't matter to you. 
So buoys can actually help you very much in these situations, but we just wanted to share this photo because uh, there can be tight quarters and fog does not help. You know, I'm going to actually go back a couple of slides here again, and I do just want to like reiterate what Scott was saying. You know, I, I'm the person who is most likely to be talking to all of these towboat pilots. And the thing I hear over and over again um, during this race is, is that paddlers will often um, sort of pass barges or approach barges um, like too close to the barge for the barge uh, pilot to be comfortable. Um, they have very limited vision with all these barges stacked in front of them. So, you know, I just want to say one more time, you know, it may seem like, oh, I'm just going to scoot around this barge. Just, I'll just go right around the edge of it and I'm out of their way. I know I'm fine. Um, but meanwhile, you know, you have um, a, a, a pilot in that pilot house who can't see you um, and they're freaking out because they don't know where you went. They knew there was a boat there, it's gone now, they can't see it. So, you know, just one more time, I mean, cause it's not just you they're passing in a race like this, they're passing person after person after person. So if, if we can all really give them plenty of space, try to be visible for them, really get out of their way. Like that's, that's gonna make everybody feel better at the end of the day. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm actually going to add one more thing, too, about fog. Um, I've spent, you know, many mornings on this race on boat ramps trying to convince people not to paddle into thick fog. Um, and there's always other people there who've done it before and can share, like, their nightmare stories about how they would never do that again. Um, so just to kind of, like, back up what Scott was saying, you know, we... Once you get out there, it gets highly, highly disorienting to even find where shore is. And so some people will try to track near shore and say, well, I'll just I'll keep in sight of shore. But then all of a sudden there's a parked barge on the side and maybe it's three deep um, and you don't really have enough reaction time to deal with that. So, you know, that's an issue for folks. Um, and I've I've even been you know, as a safety boat pulled over onto a sandbar, letting the fog burn out. And we've, we've seen, you know, a light coming upstream at us, maybe for like a half an hour or so. And we finally realized that it's actually, you know, one of our racers is paddling upstream, thinking that they're going downstream. They got turned around in the fog and they didn't even realize that they were actually paddling against the current. Um, that kind of stuff. I've heard many stories like that. That happens all the time. And um, most people that have paddled in, in this thick river fog uh, regret it and, and won't do it again. So um, just go ahead and listen to those folks. Yeah, and on the topic of fog, um, if you're pulled up, like I've, I've experienced where the fog is actually so thick, I can't see the water past the front of my boat. And that's so extreme. And I don't think in often day-to-day -day life you experience that kind of situation but yeah if like Scott or like Steve was saying you know if you think or one of you <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're thinking about hugging the you know the bank and just kind of inching along it's still not a great idea because even a wing dike pops up in front of you you don't know there you know it's just in thick fog you, you really can't see far at all so best to just wait it out. Um, storms are easy to track now with your phones, a weather app, whatever website you like looking at. You're going to have your smartphone. You're going to have it charged. So have that ready to go to keep track of weather. Um, have your ground crew do the exact same thing. So if they see something popping up in your area, they can give you a call or a text and let you know what's coming your way in case you haven't checked on weather in a little while. And storms do pop up out of nowhere in the Midwest. So don't wait for one to hit before you get off the water. And if you start seeing dark clouds, hearing thunder in the distance, you need to be ready to react and make a change of plan. So ideally you're finding a safe place coming into the nearest ramp 
to find shelter and also staying at that location longer than you might like to in order to wait out the storm. And that might not be a planned ramp that you had with your ground crew. Your ground crew might be well downstream waiting for you at the planned ramp. If there isn't a ramp close by, then you need to start looking for an exit off the water along the bank. So if you see lightning or hear thunder, the only safe place is off the water. Even if lightning hits a mile away from you on the water, that electricity can travel a distance using water as a conductor. And the worst thing that can happen if people are impacted by lightning is that they're knocked unconscious. So, you know, if you're knocked unconscious in the boat, like you're likely not going to be staying in the boat and um, now you're unconscious in the water. So you don't want to be in that situation, pulling up along shore, waiting it out. Um, that's the best bet. Um, it is your responsibility to be aware on the water just in generally. So that includes storms. And as you're planning ramp to ramp, also think about what you need to do if you have to pull over into a location without your crew or maybe without anyone else around. You might be completely alone in, in that situation. Do you have enough dry clothing to stay warm? Do you have dry clothes for after this storm? If you get wet, enough calories to be there for a while. And so your ramp to ramp planning should include pop-up storm scenarios. Um, last year, if you raced in the MR340 your first year, last year in 2022, you were lucky because there weren't any storms during our race. And so don't plan on that happening again. You need to plan on a storm, at least one. Um, so be ready for that scenario and, and sort that out, plan that out ahead of time with your gear, your required gear and your ground crew. So a common call that gets called into safety dispatch is related to storms and especially the post nighttime storms when people might be cold because they're wet and they have to, they had to pull over in a storm. So if they have stopped their activity and they don't have enough calories and they, you know, they've been paddling all day and night, they're shivering and they're calling safety dispatch because they're in trouble. So um, hypothermia is a definite threat in this race, even in August. So um, avoid all those issues and make good decisions um, in your planning. Safety boats that are, uh, there will be safety boats parked at various ramps um, and they'll have a good idea of the weather forecast too. They'll be watching that. So get all the information you can from all of your sources, keep it in the front of your mind. Uh, that these things can pop up and have what you need with you to get through a storm when you experience one. You know, um, one other thing I'm going to add in too that's on this slide is, you know, waiting until the wind hits is too late. So um, a lot of times the first thing, the first sign that you have that a storm's about to hit um, is that really intense wind. And if you're out on the river, um, that can kick up some um, pretty amazing waves really quickly. Um, and then it gets super hard to get to shore. So um, like this idea that you're just going to wait till the storm hits, you know what's coming, but you just, you're just you just going to wait till it hits before you get over. Um, I've seen a lot of people regret that decision. All right, prevention is key to heat related illness. So you wanna spend most of your time thinking about prevention um, when it comes to heat stress. That's the most import important part of avoiding a bad situation. And some ways you can help avoid these problems during the race include staying protected from the sun. You'll see a lot of racers wearing um, wide brimmed hats, long sleeves, covered legs. And you might think that that sounds kind of miserable and hot for the summertime, but covering up does protect you from sun. And depending on your clothing that you wear, are wearing could actually keep you cooler. So check into all that good stuff. You might need to wear sunscreen under clothing also. 
Um, but for sure, don't rely on sunscreen 100% of the time on bare skin throughout the race because sunburn alone can pull you out of the race. So use the river to your advantage. You can dip your hat in the water, keep a handkerchief around your neck, dip that in the water throughout. If you're at a sandbar or a checkpoint, you've got your PFD on, you can submerge yourself, get wet, use that cool water. You'll want to drink plenty of liquids, add some sport drinks throughout your day, eating salty snacks, and in general, just keep eating and drinking. Um, there likely will come a time when you don't feel like eating or drinking, and um, that's a, a recipe for disaster for some people too. Um, you can get an upset stomach, like just being, you know, physically active in the heat all day and night, um, exhausted, sleep deprived, you know, can create an upset stomach by itself. And so got to keep pushing those liquids and food. And that is where your ground crew can help you by monitoring all the food and liquids. So have them be part of that monitoring job of, of what, what you're doing in the boat. When they see you at a ramp, they'll be able to tell if you've been able to drink and eat all of the things that, that they passed you at the last time that they saw you. And they can monitor that. They can push you in the direction you need to go. And if you're planning to stay with your crew at a ramp for a while, especially in the middle of the day, um, take if you're going to take a break somewhere and you have an, the option to get in there air conditioned vehicle to take a nap, do that um, and get out of the hottest part of the day. Also educate your crew and um, yourself on heat related illness ahead of time, what to look out for. You're gonna know you best, your crew knows you best and they need to be keeping an eye on you, asking how you're doing, how you're feeling and they should be um, asking you these things and you should be really honest with them. So. Uh, watch out for all the things on this list as, um, you know, you might encounter some of these symptoms and they can kind of keep up on you. So all this, all the things on this list are things you, you should be watching out for. Um, I will say, you know, the thing on this list of confusion, that's if, if you're in the MR340, you're probably going to come off as confused to a large number of people at ramps at some point. <laughs> And so um, this is, again, where your ground crew comes in, like, is this normal for this person? Is this person just tired? You know, so um, definitely have an uh, honest conversation with them. Our volunteers and our staff might not recognize these things in you um, as well as you or your crew would. So keep your safety dispatch card in your boat. You're going to receive a couple of those in person at race check-in, one for you, one for your crew. And flag down or call and speak to dispatch if you need some urgent liquids or food even while you're on the water in case you happen to run out between ramps. It happens sometimes. And so don't tough it out. Don't be afraid to ask. And it's not going to disqualify you from the race. Like obviously don't use a safety boat as your, you know, refuel. But, um, you know, if something, an emergency comes up and you're out, then feel free to ask for that and help each other out. Too. So if you're paddling near another racer and they run out of liquids or food, help them out if you can. Um, heat related illness can really be difficult to reverse once these things start progressing and it takes a lot of time to reverse. So that alone can lead to your DNF, your did not finish up to 340. And so it's possible that once you start down this path, you might not have time to reverse these effects to get back into the race um, in a healthy situation before a checkpoint closes. So if you look at each of, if you look at these symptoms individually, they might not seem too much on their own. It's, they just keep compounding and getting worse. So watch out for them early on. And then just try to prevent this as much as possible. Don't push through it if you feel like, if you feel like you're having issues. Carp as a fun topic on the Missouri River during the MR340. They are an invasive fish found in Missouri and many other places. And so generally they're not gonna be in the water channel 
generally exceptions to all of this, but most of the time, since you're going to want to be in the channel and um, following that best path for your race, you're likely to not experience these fish. They tend to be behind wing dikes and in the slow water closer to shore. But um, again, if, if you're going to duck behind a wing dike to avoid a barge or something, you're probably going to experience carp. And if you startle one, then what can often happen is one gets startled and jumps and then that fish startles another fish and that fish jumps and then you get this situation. So um, this is kind of extreme, this picture, <laughs> but it can happen like that. And uh, they jump out of the water quickly. So you can't really predict where they're gonna be. They can hit you, your boat. They can knock something off the deck of your boat. They could jump into your boat. Um, they can injure you. So just be aware of them. And especially when you're getting into that slow, those slower water areas. And this picture is probably from the Illinois River where the carp is much worse because of the slower water from the locks and dams. Um, so we, we really never really see <laughs> it this intense on the Missouri River, but, um, uh, but it's a great picture. <laughs> yeah, it it puts into a picture what it feels like. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, okay, so required and recommended gear. This is the full less list of required and also recommended gear for 2023. So each year we do tweak a little bit. So definitely check this out on the website. Um, the mr340.org website under resources slash gear, you can find these lists and even a little bit more information about some of these. Um, make sure you have the required gear in advance of the start and look into what items from the recommended list make sense for you too. Once you have all your gear in order, make a plan for how you are gonna secure your gear on your boat or on your person. You basically wanna be prepared for that kind of worst case scenario that involves you tipping your boat, maybe combined with severe weather, and maybe combined with being at night. You know, all of those things um, snowball, they kind of cascade, you, they sort of feed off of each other. So, um, you know, having an idea and a plan of how the stuff's gonna be secured in your boat in preparation for that unexpected thing um, is really is a big part of your safety plan. So first, very, very important and also required is to wear a PFD at all times during the MR340 race. Um, we require either a Coast Guard approved or ISO approved PFD. That can include some of the inflatable belt types. And to be honest, that's not really what we would all prefer that everyone was wearing. Um, something that doesn't require manual inflation is, is really ideal for this situation for a long race like this with unknown conditions. Because um, we don't know what in the course of 340 miles you might encounter and the thing to always be prepared for, like Christina said, is if for some reason you were to become unconscious for a variety of reasons while you're out there in the river, um, having something that can passively keep you afloat is ideal. But again, our race rules are a Coast Guard approved or ISO approved PFD. So that um, does not exclude inflatable or belt types. This PFD is absolutely gonna keep you safe until someone can help you. There's never enough time to put on a PFD when something happens. So that's why we require it at all times during the race when on the water. This can also be a disqualification if our safety boats or race staff see somebody who's either refusing to wear a life jacket or continuously forgetting to put it on. It's that important. We really need you to be wearing these during the race. In addition, um, when you're seeing this safety video for the first time, you might still have a couple weeks left before the race. If you have not practiced in your boat 
self-rescue on even flat water, you should do that now between now and the race. That should be the one thing you make sure that you experience before the race, so you know what it's like, so you can help plot through how you're gonna get back into your boat if you do end up in the water. And just know what it feels like. You also need to secure the crucial gear that you need in your boat, um, using carabiners, dry boxes, dry bags, things tied into your boat, whatever it needs to, to uh, keep things um, in your boat in the situation that you might capsize. Um, we also ask that you know in the rules that you have a signal light of some kind. And at the very least, that could be a chemical light tied to your PFD, also a whistle tied to your PFD, covering both the auditory and visual ways to signal somebody. If the only thing you have is what you're wearing, at least you'll have those two items. Um, but obviously, if you do end up in the water for whatever reason, you do want to try to keep your boat and your paddle. So that's one of the first things you're gonna really wanna get together if you do end up in the water. Grab that paddle, grab your boat. It helps you stay afloat and it's also gonna be your way out of there. So we get the hold of those things as you're figuring out your next move, your PFD is keeping you afloat. All of those things make every step that might happen after that so much easier. So just keep those things in mind. The last thing I'm gonna say is that if you do end up in the water, keeping in mind everything we just said, probably the most important thing is to practice calm. So to calm yourself down, breathe, concentrate on your breathing, gathering your stuff together. Then you start looking, where's the water taking me? You have to work with the water, not against it. Work with the river. Um, you can't fight the current on the Missouri River. So you're gonna look downstream and you're gonna try to find a place that looks like a safer place to get to shore where you can either call for help, ask for assistance from other paddlers or safety boats, and just kind of take things one step at a time. So another important, very important safety role that we have on this race, because the race does run at night, is that we require navigation lights on all of the boats participating. This diagram is showing you the proper layout. So your bow light is on the front of your boat. It needs to have red on the left or port side and green on the starboard or right side, just like this is showing. If you have lights that are 360 degrees, you are allowed to use electrical tape to block off a portion of that light that might shine into your eyes. The important thing is that the lighted portion of that light is more than 180 degrees. So more than half of that field pointing forward. The important thing is, is that people can see you from whatever angle they might be approaching your boat, that they're gonna see one of these lights. So then on your stern, the rear end of your boat, that's where the white light goes. Um, ideal situation is that it's mounted on a higher uh, stick or stem of some kind, you know, getting it up in the air and visual, but some people also have stern lights mounted directly to their boat. Um, and the same thing, you can, you can also block off a portion of that so it's not shining behind you, disturbing your night vision, but it's absolutely crucial that other boats can see you. Um, the brighter, the better um, to a certain extent. You know, you don't wanna ruin other people's night vision, but being bright enough that people can see you if they're in a motorboat, for example, traveling on the river. Um, if you're paddling at night um, and you come across someone whose lights don't appear to be working, they might not be aware of that. So please do let them know and you know, when you're out in the river at night, it can be pretty tough to like try to reach behind and adjust or fix a light. So if you see somebody who has a light that doesn't work, please, you know, come up to them, let them know it's not working and offer to help if possible. You know, if, if you can reach something that they can't reach, maybe it's they just need to, you know, hit a button to turn it on. They forgot to when they got in the boat um, or maybe they need to replace that light. But um, if you 
If you do have a light that malfunctions and you don't have an extra light to replace it, um, we really need you to get off at the very next boat ramp and fix that problem. You can talk to safety boats. Sometimes they have extra lights or tools that can help fix things. Um, if you do happen to see a safety boat at night, um, but you know, if, if your lights are not operational, we need you to fix that as soon as possible. And ground crews, that should be the last thing that you triple check um, as folks are leaving at night. Just make sure all those lights are, are operating. Um, if you don't have your light situation figured out yet before the race, there are some really awesome solutions. We've got some stuff linked from our web page. You can look on the Facebook group or some of the past forums and, and search for navigation lights or lights and see some of the options that people um, have found that work really great. You know, some of these have batteries that last a hundred hours. So you just turn them on. You don't even have to turn them off. You just let them go for the rest of the race. And that's kind of nice. All right, let's talk about the Reaper. We have several safety boats, but this one has a very specialized mission. Uh, the Reaper's job is to, to sort of maintain the exact minute by minute pace that a paddler would need to just barely make a checkpoint cutoff time. So the Reaper will run at that pace all day long. You know, as soon as the race starts, they are on a schedule and they start at the 8 a.m. start. So a lot of you solos will never even see the Reaper. I mean, it will all, you will have an hour lead on the Reaper. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, there's some confusion always that, well, what if the Reaper passes me before Waverly? Am I out? No, the Reaper can pass you and then you can pass the Reaper back and then the Reaper might pass you again. I mean, if you're, if you're going that pace, you, you will interact with the Reaper frequently. All that matters is, who wins the race to that first Waverly ramp. And if the Reaper beats you to that first upstream Waverly ramp, then yes, you are out of the race. Um, we, we have the expectation that, you know, folks are prepared and ready to do this race. And um, so part of that is cutoff times and the cutoff time at Waverly is tough. And so the Reaper is a visual representation of whether or not you're on pace for that. Um, so there's kind of much like the start, there's an imaginary line that crosses the river from the upstream end of that ramp and, or I guess from the downstream end of that ramp at Waverly. And, uh, and so that's the line we're looking at. And so part of my job is to be at that ramp watching and it'll be my call if, uh, if the Reaper won or you won, but you can solve a lot of that just by being efficient out there and, uh, and making sure that you're as fast as possible those first few hours of the race. Um, they will generally talk to you if they pass you. Uh, you know, they'll have a conversation with the crew of the Reaper. They'll let you know, perhaps they'll have some advice for you um, as, as ways to improve or get, find better lanes in the channel to speed up. Um, if they're not taking any joy in passing you. Uh, it's, but it's part of their job. And I would say, I don't know, as the race has grown, it's become more frequent. Like maybe last year there were three or four boats that got eliminated at Waverly, but we've gone years and years where no one got eliminated at Waverly. It just depends on how fast the water is and how prepared all the paddlers are. Uh, obviously things you can do, you know, you can plan to just stay in the boat from call point to Waverly. You shouldn't be uh, pulling up, you should hopefully have figured out, you know, how to pee in your boat, how to eat in your boat, how to have enough food and water to make it without having to stop, have your boat in good repair. So you're not having to stop somewhere to adjust the rudder four times on the way to Waverly. Right. So all that stuff is dialed in and you lock in and you head to Waverly and you hopefully will never see the Reaper. Now the Reaper, uh, it might get a call from safety dispatch from Steve. And he says, Hey, we're looking for this red canoe that's having issues. Can you go find them? We think there's five miles downstream of you. If that's the case, then the Reaper will accelerate off her pace and go down and help somebody. So if they pass you going fast like that, obviously that's not anything to be worried about. They will have a, there's a Reaper flag. It's 
It's a black flag that's maybe seven or eight feet in the air that they fly when they're in quote reaping mode. And uh, if that flag is down, that means they're on a different assignment. I think we can go to the next. Yeah, this, this shows you the guide. They have this tape to the dash of their boat and it is minute by minute, mile by mile, what time hack they're supposed to meet. So we've got it down to the minute. And so they are constantly reassessing their speed. And when, you know, when you see them out on the river, they are exactly on the pace to make that cutoff time to Waverly. So it's not just guesswork, there's a science to it. The checkpoints uh, are meant for your safety. We have to, you know, we have 20 safety boats out there and we have to keep the race tight enough that those safety boats can cover everything. So um, we have to keep your sense of urgency all week out there with us. These cutoff times are pretty easy after Waverly. I mean, if you make Waverly and you do some paddling after Waverly before sunrise, most of these will, will never be an issue for you unless you have you know, other issues that are slowing you down. Uh, these are the cutoff times where you're out of the race if you don't meet these cutoff times. And this is an 85 hour pace for the 8 a.m. start. Solos, you get a bonus hour. And so we really don't feel sorry for any solos that are you know, five minutes behind this pace because you're actually an hour and five minutes behind this pace. You got an hour lead and there's a good chance. Well, not a good chance, but there's a possible chance that we would all have to start at eight if we have bad weather at call point in the morning. So 85 hours is the rule. 86 hours is the generosity of that 7 a.m. start due to the size of the race. Um, so you got to be aware of these things. The math gets really hard by day two and three and four to do in your head, but your ground crew should be able to know what kind of pace you're on and if you're capable of making the next checkpoint. This is really how your planning should be structured each day and night of the race. What do we need to do to beat this cutoff time? What can we do to bank hours? You, you know, if it's, if it's a beautiful night and a full moon and great weather and you waste it because you don't feel like paddling, well, guess what? The next night might be fog, thunderstorms, tornadoes, who knows? And then you don't have the option of paddling. Uh, when you have good conditions, use it. Use it, use it, use it. The, the pain and misery you're in is only going to go away by staying in the boat and pointing it downstream and keeping things moving. I'm also going to mention, too, in addition to the, the official checkpoints, we have listed places that we refer to as paddle stops. So those are, they're not official checkpoints, but they're places that we generally will have safety boats stationed um, many of them will have food or water available either um, right near the ramp or a short distance away. Um, so those are really good places often to stop where you can meet up with your ground crew, resupply, where, but you know might be less busy than some of the other actual official checkpoints. Um, and some of those are shown on this race course map. Yep. And remember that you don't have to stop at any particular checkpoint or ramp. So um, that's the beauty behind the MR340 being a nonstop race. So your stops, your connections with your ground crews are up to you and how you want to strategize all that. So checkpoints are official checkpoints for your check in and check out with Race Owl, which we'll get to, but you can have some fun and planning and strategizing these stops with your crews outside of the checkpoints too, and paddle stops. Um, the race course map, it's the same as last year. We just changed the year on it. So all that is the same info. So similar to the last slide, this is just that map view showing these places in relation to each other and um, showing some of those additional ramps also. So this or some version of it should be something that you keep a copy of while you're racing, whether that's in your phone or laminated copy, whatever you like. Um, you should have an idea of what these places are. 
Um, and your ground, ground crew should, should have that too. The Huntsdale ramp, known in years past as the Catfish Katie's ramp, will again this year be available for you to stop. It's River Mile 179.6 on River Left just before Cooper. So we'll have a great uh, group of awesome folks there again this year. So that's one of those additional ramps if you feel like stopping there. But um, yeah, this is something you can gaze at while you're knocking the miles away. And um, I was gonna say calculating your miles, math goes away, you know, day two or something. So you just need something visual to kind of help you list it out. <laughs> um, and uh, and to know what where you're at in relation to reaper time that Scott was talking about. That's listed on here too, what the reaper pace is. So, but are there other ramps other than these checkpoints and paddle stops? Yes, there are, there are many. So if you go to mr340.org and visit the resources um, tab, there's a race course page. It has this map and a list of all the other potential maps, or sorry, ramps that you can stop at. And uh, there's a map, there's an interactive Google map there. So your ground crew can use that to even um, help themselves with nav you know, navigating to the next location where you're at. So lots of options. This is just that snapshot of the checkpoints and paddle stops. Okay, markers. So... I suggest you look at Google Maps ahead of time and check out what all of these ramps look like. If you haven't been there to some of them in person, um, you know, check them out on Google Maps and just kind of get an idea of where they're situated, what's going on around them in terms of, you know, how they angle into the water, what the approach is to get into some of these places ahead of time. And all of the checkpoints and then some of those paddle stops that we listed will be marked for you with one of these big feather flags and then also a flashing light at night, that night signal. So you can choose to stop at any of the checkpoints or paddle stops if you wish. Remember that you don't have to. Um, if you do listen to the instructions coming to you from the ramp, especially at night, it's not always clear when you've been out on the water in darkness um, as to how to approach some of these places. So um, the lights can be a little disorienting and as you're getting close to the ramp and it's not uncommon to be a little confused right there as you're coming in, trying to decipher the lights and just the depth of the space there. So if you're a ground crew, please be mindful of flashlights and don't shine flashlights on paddlers because you're definitely shining a flashlight in their their face if you're doing that. And that that doesn't help matters as they're temporarily possibly blinded trying to turn into a boat ramp at night. It's great to shine lights down the ramp, lighting up the ramp space, helping uh, paddlers see what's coming up and get a visual for the space there next to the water. Every ramp's a little different and again, can be confusing at night. Um, even if, you know, you've done this race before, you might kind of forget what some of these places look like. And so anything to keep the lights out of paddler's eyes, make it very clear and, um, good communication at the ramp is really good. Generally, it's a good idea to catch the eddy just past a ramp and paddle back up a bit into slow water. So another good reason to look at a Google map, or even if you have time and you're in the area of some of these places, go check them out during the day. Not every single ramp on the river, obviously, will have a flag and flasher. So we're going to have a presence at the checkpoints and many of those paddle stops. But um, if you're headed to an alternate ramp like Hartsburg or some other ramp, we won't have a presence there and we won't have a flag or flasher. But your ground crew can meet you at any of those places and they can assist you into those places. So make sure your ground crew has a way to also, so you don't just pass right by. All right, boat ramps. Um, 
This ramp is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that cracked me up so much. Um, so we have to keep the ramps clear for emergency vehicles, other recreational boaters, basically everyone. So there will be people paddling or boating on the Missouri River, taking jet skis out that are not part of this race. And we, we have to share all of these spaces with everyone all the time. So um, we need to keep all accesses available for everyone, especially emergency vehicles, and maybe not even emergency vehicles for some of you, maybe there's some other emergency. So we just gotta keep them as clear as possible. We have amazing volunteers at a number of ramps at those checkpoints and many of those paddle stops um, whose job it is to help manage this boat traffic of you all and keep you all moving up and off the ramp when you get to some of these places. So if you're coming in to stop at a place that's really busy and you know you likely are going to need your ground crew to assist in that movement of your boat, it depends on the location, but some of our volunteers are able lifters of boats and are excited to be part of that, um, but sometimes they need a hand too. So try to be really efficient at boat ramps, especially those first couple, the first couple days, they get really congested at the beginning of the race when everyone is so tight on the course. So, and the ramps can be slick, especially any underwater portion. Hopefully ramps will have underwater portions <laughs> um, this year, it's, it's low. Um, so when you're getting out, be mindful of what you're stepping on. It could be slick, it could be wet, it could be rocks. Um, lean forward when you're getting out of your boat. Eventually, the longer you spend in your boat, the harder it is to kind of get in and out of the boat and be steady on your feet. So think about that as you're stepping out, have your ground crew assist you with all of this as much as they can. And uh, especially if you're gonna have to stop on a bank somewhere, be mindful of that. You might be stepping onto mud that's an inclined surface. All right, ground crews. Every boat must have a ground crew. So your options are an in-person ground crew or a virtual ground crew. So if, if you're calling yourself self-supported, that's fine to say, but that doesn't mean you are not having a ground crew for this race. You are required to have some sort of ground crew, whether in-person or virtual. So an in-person crew is highly recommended and they're going to be following you by road, ramp to ramp, meeting all of your needs. They're going to watch your progress on Race Owl, the app or the website, and know with close accuracy when you're likely to be at your, your next planned stop or checkpoint. So if you're exceptionally late to meeting them anywhere, um, they're going to know to contact you or worst case contact safety dispatch. They're gonna have one of those cards that you'll give them from check-in on the 31st. Um, they're gonna be tracking you. So they're gonna be the first people to know if something's amiss. So um, virtual ground crews mean they aren't physically there to meet you, but they're still tracking you remotely through Race Owl. They're still in touch with you. They can do that by text, phone calls, just as often, possibly more, if you're not going to have an in-person crew, you're going to need to have good communication with your virtual crew. And this is really important because they would alert us again, if you were late to a planned location. So we might not know anything was amiss until, you know, I'm closing a checkpoint and I'm trying to locate you. So your virtual crew would know earlier than that because they'd be paying attention to your progress. They'd be checking in with you. They would see when something didn't line up right. Um, and they too, the virtual crew, would be contacting safety dispatch. So share that safety dispatch information with your virtual crew. Um, also, you can have your ground crew watch this video. It can help inform them of what you are likely to experience during the MR340 and what some of their expectations are crewing for you too. Another thing that some ground crew can end up doing during the 340, which is always awesome, is giving extra help to other people, even our volunteers. So 
recruit a crew who can help lift your boat. We appreciate their help in keeping ramps clear along the course. And uh, I mentioned you have to keep that safety dispatch card with you in your boat if you need help on the water. And just be really aware at all ramps. It can be really crowded. Um, and uh, sometimes people do weird things when they're tired and especially paddlers. So doing weird things. So a racer could be right behind your vehicle asleep if you're a ground crew in person and you're parked somewhere. Um, just weird, look, watch out for weird things. You know, someone sleeping behind a car, or parking a boat behind a car or leaving their gear behind your car. Check out your car before you leave any location. Um, and uh, it's really important for ground crews that they have, uh, that if they do have children along that, you know, those, even though that the, the ramps are great places to cool off in the water, um, especially racers who are overheated, um, but even, you know, spectators, your ground crew, family and friends coming out to see you, um, if they're doing that, cooling off in the water, they really need to have a PFD on. So that's especially true for children. And if children are playing anywhere near water, they really need to have that PFD on and also have an adult watching them closely the entire time. So it doesn't take much for kids to have their feet not touch the ground, especially in moving water at, at a ramp's edge. And so without a PFD on to make sure they're staying on top of the water, that can be a dangerous situation in a second. So please ground crews, if you're traveling with children and just anyone in general, we need to keep an eye on everyone uh, that may be cooling off or in the water. All right, so what we're gonna do now is kind of run through the race course and bring out a few little tips that will help along the way. So this, this first slide is showing some of the first ramps that could be a potential you know, early exit if things are really going bad right off the bat or places to check in with your ground crew because you forgot something that you needed or um, you just need to dial something in in your boat. So, um, the first one would be Labanee Park. That's uh, about 15 miles downstream from race start. Labanee Park is where the 291 bridge crosses uh, the Missouri River. Um, and it, as you're paddling downstream, that would be on your right side. Um, so we often see people stopping there uh, just to kind of, you know, tweak their rudder or, um, or some of their gear. The next spot, would be uh, on the left side, the Cooley Lake um, MDC access, and that's at mile 341.2. And then on the south side of the river, the right side um, at mile 337 is Fort Osage. And, and that's a pretty small ramp. There's not a lot of parking there, but you know, that's another option for hooking up with your ground crew. So Waverly, of course, is the first checkpoint. And, you know, many places along this race, there are railroad crossings near these boat ramps. Because Waverly is the first checkpoint, it is an extremely crowded place on this race. We have a lot of people in close proximity to each other paddling, meeting up with their ground crews. And there is a railroad crossing right there by the ramp. There's no gate there though. There's no railroad gate, so there's no flashing lights. If railroads are crossing through, if trains are crossing through there, there's really not gonna be any warning except hearing the train and then when they start honking their horn and, and you feel that rumbling train coming. So we really, really, really need all ground crews and paddlers to be fully aware at Waverly you know, if ground crews have pets or children or anybody that you're paying special attention to, just absolutely make sure everybody's looking, paying attention to those railroads coming through Waverly. So Waverly has two boat ramps. There's one upstream of the bridge here, it's called boat ramp one. Um, and then downstream of the bridge is boat ramp two. So for the race, both ramps are gonna have porta potties and there should be Boy Scout troops, local Boy Scout troops selling food at both of those ramps. Um, 
So either one's an option. If things are really looking crazy at boat ramp one, you might just try out the second one. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's not, they're not right next to each other, right? So you're, you know, if you're meeting your ground crew, you're gonna wanna communicate with them which, which ramp you wanna head to um, so that they can meet you down there. Um, and on this map, you can also see those, those railroad tracks just right here, you know, coming in, in both directions um, by both boat ramps. So again, everyone just really needs to pay attention. A lot of people are gonna have to park uphill from either one of these locations for the ground crews, um, either along the road, up in the park, and they're gonna have to walk down the ramp to meet your folks. There's just absolutely not enough parking close by at, at either of these locations for the amount of people that will be stopping there on day one. Um, you know, I, I got to say, like, Waverly is a pretty small town, but uh, Waverly people have been unbelievably helpful volunteering at the ramps, making sure there's amenities for you folks. Um, it's just one example, and there's many along the race, where you have an outside, outsized amount of, of sort of love and effort put into this race from the local people, um, much bigger than the actual size of the towns, and it just really shows sort of the beauty and the heart of, of so many of these small river towns in Missouri. Okay, so Hills Island. Hills Island is 12 miles downstream of Waverly. You know, Waverly is the checkpoint with the cutoff time at 8 p.m. So you've got to make it to the boat ramp uh, by 8 p.m. And at that point, you can rest. But what we really, really, really suggest is that as quickly as you can, get back in your boat and try to make a few more miles. And Hills Island is a really great destination. It's 12 miles downstream. You can make a few more miles, get ahead of that Reaper pace. Because, um, you know, Waverly is really no place that you want to end up sleeping at night, even accidentally. Um, and then waking up in the morning and then trying to make that Glasgow cut off the next day. Um, if, in fact, for people that sleep through into the morning at Waverly and then try to paddle to, to meet that Glasgow cutoff, um, rarely, rarely do people actually get that done because um, it's, it's just a very difficult uh, move to make. So once you hit Waverly, you've made that checkpoint, you made the cutoff, Hop back in your boat, head downstream, look for Hills Island. Um, Hills Island's gonna be on your right side. And this map kind of shows, you know, there's a, a large trailing dike closing off um, a chute behind the island. You're gonna go by a couple um, other dikes, and then there's you know a big sandbar wrapped around this island. And, and at this river level, it's probably sand all the way across here. Um, we'll have a safety boat posted there. They're going to make a fire so you can see it from the river. Um, and you know, like you, you come there at night and it, it kind of looks like a war zone. You know, just like bodies <laughs> lying everywhere, just crashing as soon as they can get out of their boat and, and collapsing and um, trying to get a few Z's before they hit the river and, and make that Glasgow cut off. Um, if you do make it to Hills Island, make sure you get your boat well out of the water and tied off. Um, don't just pull it a little bit out of the water and expect that it's going to be there when you wake up. Um, crash for a few hours before you head back on the river. Um, yeah, and so Hills Island is, again, at mile marker 281 um, on your right. And the Reaper is going to stop at Hills Island that for a while that night, I believe. So if you want to, you know, if, if you've had a close call coming into... Waverly with the Reaper, that's where you can get some rest and then get ahead of it and possibly not ever see it again for the rest of the race. Yeah, the Reaper will be at Hills Island and I think they leave about 6 a.m. in the morning. So you'll be able to, uh, yeah, definitely know when they're leaving. And I would hate to have to try to catch, I would hate to leave Waverly at 6 a.m. knowing the Reaper was leaving Hills Island at 6 a.m. and they had a 12 mile lead. That would be really depressing. Oh, that's okay, cool. so here we have uh, Brunswick or Ag Services. It's uh, downstream of Miami. The reason we put this in here is just to remind you of the danger of 
barges tied off to shore. You can see a bunch of them tied off to shore there. And so, you know, this, this facility is well lit, but again, like we're not, we're going to keep stressing to you if it's foggy and you're hugging that left bank, uh, you can very quickly find yourself in a absolutely dangerous and deadly situation. If you get pinned under the front of one of those parked barges, I mean, I don't even know if we've talked about what actually happens. I mean, your boat gets pinned there and then it slowly gets pulled underneath. You get pulled underneath and you hopefully can get out before it's too late. But uh, yeah, so that's why this picture is included here. Just be aware that these facilities exist. You're going to see those lights and you're going to wonder, is this a town? Is this uh, anything? Is this a checkpoint? No, it's ag services. And this is where uh, a lot of grain and fertilizer and stuff gets loaded onto barges for transport all over the world. Uh, this is Lisbon Bottoms. Uh, it's sort of developed a bit of a legend over the years. I mean, this is a, a kind of a more natural looking part of the river from up above. This is what it used to look like everywhere. Um, you can see where there's been a lot of rock work to try to constrain it. Uh, the, you know, the river kind of wants to make two similar sized channels and um, the Corps of Engineers would prefer that the river just have one big channel, one little channel. So that's what all this rock work is doing. Uh, a lot of people who kind of armchair quarterback this race all year as they're planning, they'll look at this and go, oh, shortcut. I'm going to just take this shortcut and save 300 yards and leapfrog five or six boats because, you know, I'm a strategic genius mastermind. Uh, <laughs> that's not the way it works. It's never worked out for anybody in the zoomed in photo. You can see that rock work um, at high water. You know, the river crests that and you can see where logs have been pinned to uh, that dike structure there. We did have one year a boat get too close to that. It was two guys in a canoe. It pinned their canoe to those logs, sucked their canoe under the logs. Luckily, they were able to jump onto that raft of logs and survive and get rescued by the Glasgow Fire Department. But their boat was crushed and never seen again. Might still be there. I don't know. At the low water levels we anticipate, that rock structure is going to be six feet out of the water. I mean, you're not even going to think about any way to go through it around it or anything else. But it, high water years, sometimes the water is flowing over that. And so that's why we include that here. If you manage somehow to get back behind there, hoping for adventure, uh, you're going to find very slow water. You're going to find a waterfall at that second dike structure. Uh, you're going to find carp jumping all over the place. I mean, it is just, you know, any of these shoots along the race course, and there are a few, um, none of them are faster than just taking the main body of the river. And if I could add, in the past couple of years, the Corps of Engineers and their contractors have actually been shutting, creating closing structures within quite a few of these shoots that widened out too much for their comfort level during the 2019 flood. So many, many of these shoots that even a couple of years ago you could have paddled through as scott said that it would be a slower paddle than the main river um or actually you can't you know actually do now so even if you could get in you're going to run into structures at some point um, that are going to keep you from actually being able to paddle through all right so um Next thing we wanted to point out is uh, Cooper's Landing. So Cooper's Landing is a uh, right about mile marker 170. It's a little riverside business. Um, they often have live music. They're probably gonna have live music the Wednesday of, of the race. Um, and, and it can be extremely crowded. Um, the store has drinks for sale, including uh, some alcoholic beverages, a bunch of non-alcoholic beverages, um, they'll likely have a couple of food trucks, um, and usually they keep that store open um, all night long on Wednesday night of the race. Um, but it's pretty tricky getting into Cooper's Landing. Um, there's a wing dike immediately upstream of the boat ramp, so you, you will be coming from the left side of this picture, moving downstream, and then 
you know, depending on the river level right now, it's fairly obvious the dike sticks out a lot. Um, but even the very end of that dike is, is a little underwater right now. Um, if the river does happen to come up quite a bit, um, then it becomes a little more treacherous. Uh, most of this dike can, can end up being underwater or all of it. Um, and so our safety boat crews do try to sort of mark or light it up in some fashion or another if, that, if that's the case. But you're gonna have to pass around and pass that wing dike and then turn around, catch the eddy on the backside to get into the boat ramp. Um, what you do need to look for, look out for is a large stern wheel paddle boat um, that will be tied up to the long dock there. And then there's likely to be safety boats tied up to the side of it and to this public dock as well. So there's quite a few little obstacles to look out for. Um, if the river remains low as it is now, it, it's no real problem necessarily paddling in there. Um, if the river does get higher, there can be some pretty weird hydraulics that want to push you into that stern wheeler. But um, if things kind of stay how they are, it should be all right. Um, Cooper's Landing uh, is a um, has a campground for RVs. I think all those slots are taken already for the 340. Um, and they're just kind of keeping one area for racers to crash around the store there. So um, it's likely to be extremely busy um, and quite hectic, but um, an awesome place to be as well. Okay, Herman is about 70 miles downstream from Cooper, so you'll have other ramp opportunities in between, but at Herman, uh, you're gonna see the Herman Bridge well in advance of the Herman ramp. That's how you know you're getting close. And if the water happens to be up at this ramp, which so far it's not, and it hasn't been for quite a while, that concrete section that is this peninsula shape should, um, you know, could be emerged in higher water. It's not right now, but, um, just pointing that out. It depends on what water level is to how much of that's gonna be exposed or not. So um, just know that things change and um, be ready to deal with whatever the situation is when you get there, when you do. Um, you can opt to come in on the upstream ramp if you want. You've got options here. There's an upstream and downstream ramp. Come in on either one, totally up to you in the dark it's probably easier to make out that upstream ramp route versus the downstream, just because when it's dark, you won't even, you might not even see that, you know, peninsula jutting out very much. So um, it might be easier just to locate in the dark to come in on the upstream. This is the only place in the race where a portage is allowed. So where you can put in at one spot and get out on the other. And that's totally fine if that's what you want to do. Um, if you get in on the upstream ramp, feel free to exit there again, right off of the upstream or haul it around, take out at the downstream, whatever you want to do. Um, there might be some debris around, just, you know, might be mud, just play it by ear. Um, there are food options in Herman. There are some great bathrooms just down from this big parking lot that's showing. It's a huge space there at Herman for your ground crew to meet you, take a nap in a car, whatever you want to do. Lots of room to get up and off the ramp at Herman. All right, this slide is showing the approach to the Washington ramp. This is not a checkpoint, um, but Washington's a great, great river town. Um, it's got a nice park and a big parking lot right next to the boat ramp. It is a pretty busy boat ramp, probably one of the busiest on the river um, in terms of recreational boaters getting on and off the river. Um, so just a heads up on that. With the river levels right now, um, the, the low water, I, I haven't been to Washington super recently, but I know that at some of these low levels, this area upstream of the boat ramp behind this long trailing dike, um, some of that has been actually like high and dry. So 
Um, not sure the current status or what it'll be the day of the race, but um, uh, keep in mind that if, if you do tuck in behind this dike for your approach, there may or may not be enough water for that. Um, but to get to the ramp, um, the water flow can be pretty intense here at the boat ramp. So once you pass that dike, you're going to want to get over kind of as quickly as you can so you can approach that ramp. Unlike most ramps on the Missouri River, the Washington ramp faces upstream. So that kind of makes it a little trickier for landing. And if you happen to miss the ramp, um, it's pretty intense current just right downstream of the ramp. And it is very difficult, if not impossible, to sort of paddle back up to the ramp if you missed it. So just a heads up on that. All right, this is the view of the Klondike ramp. And new this year to the area of the Klondike ramp is Miss Augusta, which um, is a luxury yacht that is currently based next to the Klondike ramp. So if you raced last year or any year previous, you didn't encounter Miss Augusta, there's a very good chance that you will this year, either on the water during the race, or you might see Miss Augusta docked at Klondike. And so we have the area circled where the Miss Augusta um, ramp is, that, or the new dock for Miss Augusta, where it's located. There are a series of wing dikes just before that. So you're not going to want to be close to river left anyway as you're approaching Klondike. You'll avoid those wing dikes. You'll avoid Miss Augusta, whether she's parked there or just her dock. You'll want to avoid that little area. And then there's also a new dock that is being built downstream from the ramp. And that's under construction potentially uh, during the race. So you might see construction, a construction crew working there. So on either side of the ramp, you've got some things to avoid, but the ramp is open um, and ready for you all at Klondike. You just need to be extra cautious as you're coming into this area. Give everything, you know, like everything else that we've been saying, just give space between you and everything else out there as you're coming into um, places with obstructions. So um, be especially careful at night and look for that flashing light at Klondike and, Klondike and instructions from ramp volunteers. So you, you might even find, your ground crew might find that parking is even a little congested there. So this is the view of Miss Augusta in her dock. So right there just upstream of the Klondike ramp and that view is looking somewhat upstream from the top of the ramp that you'll actually be using. And then the picture underneath is just a different angle, still looking more upstream from the ramp, um, a little further down the ramp. And so you can see some of those wing dikes showing behind Miss Augusta there too. So be especially careful if you stop at Klondike, look for instructions and especially careful at night to avoid that left bank area. And help each other. So we count on you to look out for each other on the water. And so we say that makes all of you a safety boat too. If you encounter someone in trouble, communicate concerns to safety dispatch. You can call safety dispatch on behalf of another paddler. And so the paddler having a potential issue isn't necessarily the, the only person that can call in in a scenario like that. And we get people calling in for other paddlers often into safety dispatch, so it's a good thing. Um, when you call safety dispatch, you want to give us your boat number, your river mile, ideally, or very close approximate location, and this is the reason to always know where you are on the water. So um, if you can stay with someone until help arrives, that's great. It's a lot easier for us to see two boats together. You can wave down a boat. Um, and uh, so whatever it takes 
throughout the course, you know, sharing liquids and food if need be, um, encouragement. A lot of people find that paddling together, especially in that first night, is an extra sense of security. If you've not paddled on the Missouri or not paddled or at night, but even just not paddled at night before. Um, nothing wrong with buddying up and a lot of people will want to do that. So there are a variety of ways you can help each other out there and we encourage you to do that. So safety boats, um, we have about 20 and potentially more safety boats along the race course. So some of these boats are actually stationed at specific boat ramps and then they're just kind of available at all times to respond if help is needed on the river or at that boat ramp. Other boats are moving down with the race course and their location moves along as the pack of the race moves downstream. Um, safety boats are available if you have an issue, you can call the safety dispatch number that's on your safety card. Um, and the dispatch is going to figure out which safety boat is closest, preferably upstream from your location, if you need a boat to respond to you. And then they'll dispatch that nearest available safety boat. In general, we're going to, we're going to again, look for that boat that's upstream of any situation they might need to deal with. That way they're not running upstream against the current kicking up a huge wake through the through the paddling uh through the race course um now you're going to quickly find out that there's whole stretches and hours that may go by without seeing a single safety boat because they're either stationed at boat ramps or they're moving um through the pace you know of the pack um especially that first night too or the first, the first day um, for lead paddlers, uh, folks that are really paddling, you know, at the, at the cutting edge um, towards the front of the pack, you know, they, they really may not see very many safety boats except stationed at ramps um, along the way. So um, that doesn't mean that they're not there or not available to help if needed. Um, but that's just kind of the nature of how things go once this race spreads out. That said, um, you know, by the time the first paddlers, the winners of this race reach the finish line in St. Charles on Wednesday, the end of the race will be way back by Glasgow. So that's about a 200 mile difference at that moment in the race. So at that moment, our safety boats are spread out throughout the pack um, and you know, for people that need a response, you know, there may be a lag time and, and there often is between when we can reach our safety boats and when they can actually get to you. It's not going to be an immediate response um, in many cases. So that's where it gets really important, like Christina was saying, is that you are all each other's safety boats as well. So we're all helping each other out out there and we definitely need to be looking out for each other. Um, and providing that first level of assistance if needed while we're getting other resources in place to get to you. All right, so, um, so as far as signaling a safety boat, if you see a safety boat passing by, you're gonna notice they're gonna be sticking their thumb up in the air as they're passing you by. They're gonna be possibly have binoculars, they're gonna be looking for your boat number, and they're gonna be writing down what river mile you are, what your boat number is. And they're also gonna be looking for you to give a thumbs up back. So if you see a safety boat and they're giving you a thumbs up, please, if you're okay and you don't need assistance, give them a thumbs up too. That tells them I'm good, you can move on. If you need anything, you know, you can wave a boat over, you can call them over, you can ask a question, waving two hands above your head, that's a universal signal for, I need help, come over and talk to me. If you're on shore and you're trying to get a safety boat to come over and give you assistance, wave those heads over the top of your head, whatever you can do to really grab their attention. If it's in the dark, you're definitely gonna need some kind of signal light. And that's why we require lights on the boat and on your person. So some kind of light to let people know that you're hidden there in the shadows. If you're needing help from the next boat that comes by, making something more visible, you know, is, is important. Um, 
again, after that time when everyone in the race is really spread out, um, then the next couple of days, we just start getting closer and closer together. So all of a sudden, Thursday and Friday, you'll be seeing safety boats all the time. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you might be hunkered over on the bank, you know, trying to relieve yourself and safety boats are checking to make sure you're okay. Um, we try to be as discreet as we can, but we really do have to check in with everybody that we see. So please be patient with us. Know that we're looking out for you. We're not trying to hassle you or harass you. Um, uh, so be be patient with us um, as we're as we're doing that. So you guys are all going to have a safety card. Um, and the safety dispatch number on there. There's going to be three safety numbers on that card um, that will be um, start at that top one. And if you don't get someone, try the next one. If you don't get someone, there's a third option as well. As you're calling, it's really helpful for you to have some information ready to share about your location, your boat number, boat number of the person you might be calling on behalf of, and the reason for the call. Just having a little bit of that information right on the front end, even if you need to write it down before you call is super helpful. But don't let that stop you from calling. We're there for you. If you are in an immediate medical emergency, that's the one time when you should call 911 first. So that 911 is gonna get routed to the nearest emergency agency to wherever you are on the, on the river. But if you're making a, a 911 call, you're gonna want that same kind of information. You're absolutely gonna need to know the nearest mile marker, what side of the river you're on, any landmarks, any kind of information. Um, because a lot of times those folks have to relay that information to someone else that might be able to help. Now, if you do have to call 911 because of an emergency, um, we do still need you absolutely to call safety dispatch immediately after that. Um, whether you're calling on behalf of yourself or someone else. Um, but I, you know, in most situations you're gonna experience on the race, just calling safety dispatch is absolutely the best and first thing to do. Yeah, and I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, if you if someone were to call safety dispatch, it, it doesn't mean we're gonna DNF you necessarily. So. You know, if, if you have a concern or a concern for another paddler, or you just want something checked on, that's totally fine. We'd rather have a conversation about it and go check it out and, you know, come talk to you or someone else. So um, it's not just for calls where someone needs to get off the river and DNF. Yeah, thanks for the clarification, Christina, for sure. Um, we end up sort of triaging and, and trying to help solve situations of all kinds out there. Okay, Ray Sowell is different this year, a little bit. So we're gonna talk about those differences um, here briefly and know that there's an entire page on the mr340.org resources um, race tracking page. There's a page dedicated to all of this with more detailed info and more links that go out to John Marble's awesome racel.com website. But just as an overview right now and a way to kind of wrap your mind around it if you're having confusion about Racel, um, it's a system that includes the website, racel.com, two smartphone apps, Racel Racer and Racel. And um, all of those things work together for racer tracking capability and checkpoint and location data from RaceAL basically provides a status of where you're at, um, your results, your data of the race of all racers during the MR340. So John Marble is the brains behind RaceAL and we are very grateful for all of his continued hard work and constant improvements to Race Owl that enable you all and our staff and our crew, our volunteers, spectators, everyone involved in the MR340 to have a great tool that is a really important part of our safety plan. So Race Owl Racer, that's the app for racers only for 2023. So this includes your race tracking, 
checking in and out of checkpoints and that DNF function in case you need to leave the race. The ability to use your own satellite tracker in conjunction with RaceL is an option, or sorry, RaceL Racer, <laughs> um, if you wish. And uh, this is the app that you want on your phone in advance of arriving to the mandatory check-in event at Caw Point on July 31st. We'll have help here um, for you to ask any questions you might still be confused about um, and just getting your first check-in at Caw Point done. So this, this is the app if you're racing, Race Owl Racer. Race Owl, the blue one, um, is the app for ground crews and spectators now. So that's the one that your ground crews, your family and friends at home, um, or anyone just wanting to view active race data through an app will use. And it'll show the estimated arrival time of racers, uh, a race map with filter options to look at you know, a checkpoint near your ground crew or near you and find out where you're at, who else is there, what's going on, and an option for ground crews to assist you with a potential manual check-in, check-out if need be. Um, there are links to download these apps on the MR340.org resource page called Race Tracking, and the raceowl.com website still exists, so that's your browser option. So ground crews, spectators, can use that from home or wherever. Um, it has the same active race data and race map available that Race Owl does. It's just the website version of that. So that's the very simplified list of Race Owl, depending on you know who you are and what your needs are, which one you need. So checking in. Um, remember, you don't have to physically go to any of the checkpoints and sign something or, you know, like the old days, have somebody sign a clipboard, um, none of that. So you can manually check in from your boat as you pass a checkpoint on Race Owl Racer, that app, or if you have the app running in the background anyway, highly recommended, it will do this for you automatically. So Race Owl Racer, that app open on your phone, running in the background, will be automatically tracking you, but also, it knows when you get close to a checkpoint and it knows when you leave a checkpoint. So it'll do your login, log out, your, your check-in, check-out um, automatically for you. All you have to do is just glance at your app and make sure it did that. Um, this little view on the left is what it looks like if you're gonna pull up a checkpoint. This one is Glasgow and you've got the check-in button on the lower left, the check-out button on the lower right, the red DNF button, those are your options if you're doing this more manually through the app. But again, it will do it on its own. You'll see your check-in and check-out automatically log right here if you're tracking anyway. So, but good to check it. Um, the little snip on the right is the navigation feature. So that's new and that's an add-on to Race Owl Racer if you wanna get that navigation feature, there is um, a small cost associated with doing that, but um, you know, um, that's definitely an option you can do and um, have that navigation all within the same app. Um, let's see, yes. So your uh, ground crew you can check you in and out if need be. Um, and uh, your ground crew should be reminding you and you know, your ground crew can keep an eye on looks, okay, yeah, I'm looking, you know, your ground crew's looking at race owl and they can see, yep, yeah, they logged in and out, they're all good. Um, if you're super duper low tech, you can still send a text message manually to the race owl phone number, old school to the same number that race owl interacts with. So that number is the 816 three, four, zero, six, three, nine, five. That's going to be on your safety card. Also, there's a formatting preference for that. Um, you'll have that information also on the safety card. So if you format it perfectly, then it sends that data into race owl and that's the end of it. If you mess up or you misspell something or do a wrong formatting thing, there is a human being behind 
um, race owl during the race that will clear that up and they get that log properly for you. But the most important thing is that you have a check in and out at every single checkpoint that is required. So um, also if for whatever reason at Caw Point on Monday, something happens Monday night and you're not able to race, you have a family emergency or something, you need to DNF in Race Owl Racer. So we know that you are not racing. We're not gonna know to, you know, we potentially might be looking for you at like Waverly if we don't know that you DNF. So it's really important to always let you, uh, let us know if you DNF. All right. Um, race L, so I guess back one more, sorry. <laughs> Um, race L racer phone care. So this is super important because the top reasons people have trouble with race owl on the water, um, is involving keeping the screen. Um, some people will have it, the screen on in full sun and, um, that's kind of, that's a bad combo. And then a dead cell phone battery, clearly, um, Race Owl isn't going to work for you in that situation, and we won't be able to contact you. You won't be able to contact your ground crew. Um, also, just user error in general. So if you can keep the app running in the background, um, and if you have that navigation feature added to Race Owl Racer, you also have a voice feedback option, and you can adjust how often Race Owl talks to you. So, you know, it doesn't have to be super annoying. <laughs> so it's up to you how long, often you want that, but that could be really helpful at night. So you're not staring at a lit screen. You can just rely on that voice feedback and it won't run your battery down as much. Um, also remember that part of your required gear for the MR340 is a cell phone with battery life and some extra battery source. So check out that gear list again that Steve showed us earlier on that resources page called gear to make sure you have everything that you need. And so having a functional phone and having race all work is very important. Um, yeah, so detailed information about race owl um, is available on mr340.org resources, race tracking page. And there are also a couple short YouTube videos linked there that John Marble has posted um, and they can really help you visualize and understand these apps too. All right. Well, we've uh, we've used this photo for years in the safety meeting, and I'm realizing that you probably have to be at least 50 years old to even know what you're looking at here. But so for those of you who are younger than 50, I apologize for this reference, but um, you can do some research. But this uh, we want to talk about, you know, prioritizing your own safety and making sure that you know when it's time to uh, withdraw from the race if things aren't going well health wise or equipment wise you know nobody knows your health situation better than you you know what kind of prescriptions you might be on you know how that might make you feel in a stressful or difficult uh, physical exertion situation uh, you know we can't tell you hey you should probably pull out of the race you are the one who has to realize gosh it's not worth pushing past this ramp and putting uh, myself in jeopardy at this point based on whatever factors you're dealing with. So you're monitoring yourself, your ground crew's monitoring you. Um, it might not be one singular issue that knocks a third of the people out of this race every year. Uh, it's quite often something we call death by a thousand cuts where, you know, you got sunburned the first day and the second day you hurt your elbow because you slipped and fell on a ramp. And then the third, you know, it's a series of things that uh, eventually make it impractical for you to continue. Or it could be a very serious thing. Like we've had people quit the race because of irregular heartbeats or, you know, things that you did not see coming, but certainly something that requires your attention. So what we ask of you is to make that evaluation at each ramp, make that evaluation each time as a ground crew, if your paddler still seems physically able to continue. I mean, this is a series of 25 to 40 mile expeditions, ramp to ramp, right? So do you have the physical ability, the mental ability to make it that next leg? Yes or no? If so, great, go for it. If you have doubt, 
then it's probably a good idea to not uh, make a poor decision and to go ahead and DNF there. We need to make sure um, that you're communicating with us that uh, you're DNFing. There's the DNF button in the app. Um, it will ask you to verify. So you're not gonna accidentally DNF. Uh, it'll say, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure? And then you can confirm that. You can also text us immediately at that text number that Christina mentioned. This will be on your safety card as well. Um, and then as she said, if, if something happens after you sign in at call point on July 31st, but before the race starts, August 1st, family emergency or whatever, please call us or text us or email us and make sure we know that. All right, this is what last year's finish line looked like from the ramp at St. Charles. And um, looking down on the ramp there, you could be finishing your race in St. Charles in the dark, but it will be lit like any other checkpoint that you've experienced throughout the race up until then. So we'll be cheering you in with some brand new cowbells. Um, <laughs> if you hear cowbells, <laughs> just aim for the cowbells. Um, Considering the current low water right now and state of the lower area of the ramp, there's a good chance we might have to have your finish just upstream on the upstream side of the ramp next to the ramp um, along the bank. But we're just keeping an eye on water levels and um, the movement of some debris and things like that right now. We'll have a proper spot lit up and direct you into your finish line regardless. So whether it's right on the ramp or right next to the ramp, we'll get you sorted out as you come in. Um, you are free to leave your boat in this big parking lot of a boat grassy area that we always have and it just fills up and it looks super cool as everyone comes in. Um, you'll have the option to leave it there. Same as with Cobb Point, you can leave it there. We ask that you don't have any of your gear and stuff like that in there. Um, and you can leave it for a while, but definitely plan to have your boat picked up by Friday evening because in the midst of our Friday evening finish line party and all of that stuff, we will be clearing out that night too. And so you definitely don't wanna leave a boat here um, past Friday evening because we just won't have anyone keeping an eye on the place after the race finish line is over. This is the finish line sign which will be posted um, near your finish and it's just a great place to start your celebration, have your picture taken, we'll have a photographer at the finish line and you might want to take your photo here but definitely snap a shot with you and your ground crew or friends and family that come out. It's really fun to officially have this moment by the finish line sign. And we'll have the finish line action going on. First finishers will be coming in Wednesday night. So we'll be there days and nights. Um, and we'll have it all going nonstop there. And we'll have a big tent by the Lewis and Clark Boathouse for you and your crew and family and friends to hang out in some shade um, or during the finish line party. The Boathouse will be serving food Thursday and Friday. It's gonna be tacos again, and they're gonna have drinks and snacks and all that kind of stuff. So also check out their museum and gift shop while you're there. That can be something really fun for your ground crew to do as they're, as they're waiting for you to come in to your finish also. Medals and trophies will be given to you once you actually reach the finish line and get off the water. So when you pull up, we're gonna medal you and potentially hand you a trophy that you might not be able to really carry um, <laughs> if you're one of the top three finishers in your division. So we'll just like be right on you there, getting you medaled and everything. And um, if you can, if you if you are a top three finisher, or even if you're not, if you can stay and enjoy the finish line party and awards ceremony Friday, that's awesome. And we'd love to see you there. The finish line party is Friday evening. Music will begin in the evening. Um, award ceremony will begin at seven and that live band will continue um, after the award ceremony until about 9 p.m. So 
Awards will be the first, second, and third place finishers for each division. So if you're handed a trophy at the ramp, we'd love to see you at 7 p.m. for the award ceremony. We'll have the merch tent set up. Um, same as at Cop Point during check-in, we'll have merch tent set up Thursday and Friday at the finish line from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. both days. There is a shower available in the lower level of the boathouse for racers. Um, Missouri American Water will have their water trailer set up and there will be sponsor booths um, set up in the mulch area on Friday also. So be sure to visit visit with our sponsors there um, and uh, stink up their pop-up tents. <laughs> but you'll have, you'll have a shower, so you'll be fine. Um, first finishers of the MR340 will begin to arrive again sometime Wednesday night, but the 85 hour cutoff concludes Friday at 9 p.m. And so some of these festivities of music and awards begin a little bit before that cutoff and we will likely be cheering in as a big group, our last finishers into the finish line. And that's always really fun. So we look forward to seeing you all Friday if you can join us there. Big thank you to all of our awesome volunteers. There's no way this thing could get pulled off without all of you. So many of these people are um, really passionate about the MR340, just like people are passionate about racing. And we'll have volunteers um, who in the past have been volunteering who will be racing. Uh, we'll just, you know, people kind of rotate throughout volunteering and racing sometimes and ground crewing. And it's really cool to see all of that. Um, people are taking their vacation, um, just like many of you are, to make this thing happen. They'll help us before, during, after the race. They're going to be working in the heat overnight, similar to what you all are experiencing. And so when you encounter them, please thank them. They'll be throughout the entire course from call point check-in, on safety boats throughout, on the water, at ramps even some working from home behind the scenes and in St. Charles. So we thank all of you who have helped make the MR340, MR340 possible and um, awesome. And we're looking forward to another year and uh, we appreciate all your help. Questions, the MR340.org site has lots of info available to you and your crew. A lot of the content of the email dispatches that have been going out to racers is there, um, lots of resource information. If you still have remaining questions in these last days before the race, feel free to email me at racing at riverrelief.org. If you have a question to pose to the huge MR340 Facebook group, feel free. There are like 11,000 followers out there. Lots of great advice. Um, one of the beautiful things about this race community is people's willingness to share their knowledge to help other people succeed in this race. And it's not just racers, it's awesome ground crew advice and our volunteering, our, our volunteers chiming in just from all angles, lots of good folks giving good information. We're super excited to be with you for four days or hopefully less than four days for you on the Missouri River for this year's MR340. So many people will be joining us this year, and we're grateful for all of your support for Missouri River Relief and grateful for what you bring to this river community. And we can't wait to see you out there in just a couple weeks. So let's do this. <laughs> <laughs>